Uh, thank you, Star. Okay. So, as um, Star mentioned, I'm Shruti Kulkarni. I'm a cybersecurity architect. And as a result of my job activities, I work with developers. I work with technical leads. I work with other architects, GRC people, so the whole gamut of uh, security people, professionals. Okay. So, without wasting much time, let me get into the um, presentation. So, it's about OWASP developer guide and here is the team. So, it's five of us who are project leaders for this uh, guide and just so you know, before I start off, this is a guide that is written for the developers and by the developers and when I mean by the developers, John, myself, um, Andrew, Harold, Vandana, we are all developers in one form or another. Okay. Um, this is the agenda for our presentation today. It's the simplicity of compromises, how to write insecure code, and the need for a developer guide. Okay. At this point, I would like to take a step back and then just regroup thoughts as to why do we need a developer guide, what is insecure code, and then uh, what are compromises that take place with applications. So when application, the world is run on applications, yeah? You take anything, it's, um, you know, your word processor, your cloud applications, your operating system, browser, they are all applications. So when applications get breached, um, the point is that the companies that run that application actually get into, um, uh, you know, they get on the front page news. But that's the uh, ancillary effect of it. The actual effect is on people like us whose data is contained in those applications. So unfortunately, our data gets onto the dark web where stuff like identity impersonation or, um, you know, uh, fr financial fraud take place. But that's our data. So with that in background, let's start off. Uh, as I mentioned, so the uh, world runs on applications. So operating systems, web servers, your database servers, firmware for firewalls, everything is an application. And actually, to write an application, you don't need much. You just need an editor with some sort of a code repository and a developer. But anybody and everybody who writes an application actually has some kind of requirements. Like, you know, they would like to, for example, write an open source operating software or operating system, or they want to create a more interactive UI for an operating system. So anything and everything, you know, has some kind of a um, requirement. And of course, if we are writing really sophisticated applications, then we actually think about compliance with PCI DSS or any local regulation uh, law or, uh, you know, uh, uh, compliance requirements. So what can go wrong with applications is you can, you know, if you don't do them correctly, you can have intellectual property being compromised. There could be vulnerabilities leading to data exfiltration, unchecked logic bombs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's see an example of that. So here is an example of code that is written to extract data from a database and present it to a user. So the left side actually contains processing of raw data from a user, uh, uh, which inputs the, uh, which runs the query against a SQL database. And the second one is an example for a query that is run against a NoSQL database. So when this sort of queries are run, what happens is this. Let me run this. Uh, am I? Okay. Okay, so this is what happens. If you have a code that actually accepts user input without validating, and this is how sometimes simple compromises can get. So the way to address this would be, wait, sorry, this is just an ex explanation of why, how it happens, because you've got an asset, you've got a boundary, a threat actor who then injects um, a malicious uh, uh, input into the search criteria or the 
query that is run against a database that results into a loss of confidentiality of the data that is contained in the database, whether it is SQL or no SQL database. So this is a sort of mitigation that you would want to have. That's a query parameterization. Now, how would we fix it? It is by making sure that we are validating the data that is uh, inputted by an end user, be it again a run against a SQL uh, database or a NoSQL database. So that's how what can go wrong. We can actually avoid that by using secure coding guidelines. Now that's just one example of uh, you know writing your applications securely. Now that is not all. There are other ways to write your, um, you know, applications insecurely. For example, we usually say that we have got, um, you know, uh, we don't have any security issues because we don't need to look for security issues. We we have uh, SAS and DAS tools, so we don't have to worry about anything. And additionally, we pen test everything, so that's why we don't need to worry about any kind of a security requirements or security uh, coding guidelines, or secure coding guidelines, or anything related to security. Then there are other ways to write insecure code, like you know, let me distribute the security checks so that it is secure everywhere and. What we are actually trying to do is um, we are trying to make it more complex so that nobody can find the security vulnerabilities with all those complexities. Um, then, you know, we can also say that my code is unbreakable, so it doesn't have any uh, vulnerabilities, and that's actually applying a default deny principle. There are there are, I have got lots of examples how we can write insecure code. Um, and to be fair, um, many of these are from my own experience. And also, there is an OWASP page which talks about how to write insecure code. I've given a link to the um, uh, application, to the yeah, uh, project that actually has many of these examples as well. I'm sure you also might have come across all these, um, uh, you know, so to speak, uh, ways of working and why people do certain things uh, and how vulnerabilities get into applications. So there are some more examples, you know, we rely on security checks done elsewhere in the code. We can write our own encryption standards. We write our own, you know, we have, we hard code our keys. Who could possibly want them for? And then encryption is good. Let's do it everywhere. We've got HTTPS. Nothing can really go wrong over here, you know. <laughs> we don't use HTTP. I, mean, I know my code, so I will build my own authentication. I'll put all my username and passwords in a database. I will not use anything else for that. And then another important one is um, sessions. Actually, I've come across so many people telling, you know, who would want such random numbers for? Why do we have to bother so much about uh, security of sessions and then about session IDs and uh, se what are session replay attacks and session predictions, etc., etc. But they are a reality of life, as we all know. And then the best part is, you know, when people tell, we don't have to worry about anything. We have never been breached. We have always been secure. <laughs> but then I always tell, if you have been secure, if you have never been breached, that means you don't know if you have been breached. <laughs> um, so the result of it is things like this happen, which make headline news on the front page. So the impact of that is, the point is, tools capture defects at a later stage in development. They don't fix defects. For example, vulnerabilities that make it hard for tools to detect, they are not detected by tools, especially missing signatures of encryption of data on mobile apps. They are not detected by tools, your SAS or DAS tools. And then privilege escalation, for example, this used to be a very popular way of adding um, elevated uh, page, for example, admin, by just appending it with a forward slash, um, that cannot be detected by a tool. So, you know, all these, you need preventive controls along with detective controls. That's what I'm trying to say. And going back and fixing defects, uh, it's, it's a lot of rework. Anybody who is a developer over here will know that, and it takes a lot of time. So, you know, not, not, Considering factoring in security into your development life cycle results into rework. And the impact of that is these vulnerabilities, when they materialize, they result into reputational loss 
for the organization and it just doesn't stop at the organization if you take it if you if you factor in that it actually affects you as well because any reputational loss means loss of customers and loss of customers means financial loss for the company and that means it means you know it may impact your paycheck and your bonus as well and in addition to that if our data is at risk then it affects us as well so make your life simple save time on rework so if you as a developer do not put security in code no one else will so writing secure code is not equal to testing the security of the code with tools so use proper security development life cycle use security architecture secure coding guidelines manage licenses build secure environment use context based access control use trust boundaries etc but this is a lot of information and then as a developer we may find it difficult to understand the whole gamut of what it means to have secure development life cycle and that's why we have got developer guide which is an overarching view of everything related to security and it is for developers so what it does is it gives you enough to get started but no more it's it's a, an introduction to each project in application wayfinder it tells you what it does why it is useful and how to run it so what it does not do is it does not detail any topic in details it does not reinvent wheel and we are not adding any over and above documentation for the projects in application wayfinder so it helps you with requirements and design by using give descriptions of tools like asvs mas skf thread dragon and cornucopia pytm it helps you with implementation for example it talks about um, cyclone and uh, secure headers etc cheat sheets it gives you links to cheat sheets then it helps with verification metrics of course we don't have much about metrics which is all we talked about <laughs> we're going to add more information about metrics um, but it talks about your training and education culture building process ma process maturing and operations so of course there's something about the gap analysis as well so log into owasp look at owasp developer guide and have a look at it and what we are actually looking for is we need volunteers to review the available content add missing content and enhance any existing uh, enhance the existing content so the the thing is none of us know everything about everything we need to lean on each other as a community we need to support each other with our learnings so that's what developer guide provides so that the community can benefit from it and that's all so here are uh, here are the, some details how you can contact us there is the github page then we have got a slack channel and these are our email addresses to contact us and this is thank you to our sponsors if you like to be a sponsor of developer guide please let us know please contact any of the uh, project leaders that's all i've got thank you